Hello and welcome to another Ecom Ops podcast. Today I'm talking to Kyle from uh, Elevate and Scale. Hey Kyle, great to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's a pleasure talking to you and uh, I think we will learn a lot today uh, about um, uh, yeah, email marketing, marketing spend and, and, and all these kind of things. Um, I just uh, visited your website and I really like uh, elevate your brand and scale your growth. So please tell me a bit more about you and uh, about your company. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I was pretty excited whenever I saw the domain was available. Whenever I first came up with the idea for the name, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe no one grabbed this yet. So uh, that was a, a good quick win. Um, so yeah, I'm the founder of Elevate and Scale. We do email marketing and we help e-commerce businesses unlock hidden revenue and put their sales on autopilot without spending any extra uh, money on advertising. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, and, and, and how did all this started? How did you came into that business or in e-commerce? So I got my start as a freelance copywriter actually years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was really just kind of doing a little bit of everything. Back then, there was a lot more focus on blogging and SEO and you know bringing traffic to your site that way. And then email marketing was a natural extension from there. Uh, and over time, after just you know do, dabbling with, I was writing a lot of sales copy, writing uh, copy for ads. The one area where I kept getting the best results was with email. And I also just really liked building out these backend systems for businesses and really the the whole you know shifting to e-com originally i was working with more service businesses not by any intention it was just it, that's just kind of what happened like that's just the clients i i kept signing uh, but after i started working with a few e-com businesses i really liked it better because it's i find it to be a little bit more straightforward where you know with service businesses a lot of times you have salespeople involved where the email can only take you so far, then that lead has to then go through part of the sales process with a salesperson doing sales calls. And so sometimes it's it's kind of hard to figure out where are the results exactly coming from, or if there's a breakdown in results, you know, where's the problem? Whereas with e-com, everything is tracked and it's very you know straightforward and simple. So you if you send them an email, and they go to the site, you see every little thing they're doing, if they add it to cart, if they complete the purchase, and you can really figure out where the breakdown is in the sales process and just attack that thing and, and improve it. So I just love that. Um, and I just thought also something about e-com people, they're, they're fun to work with. They're just, they're, they're different than a lot of the type of clients I had been working with in the past. And so, yeah, I decided, you know what, I like this a lot better. So I'm just going to focus on this from here on out. That's cool. It's really cool. Um, you, you worked with a lot of companies. How can how can e-commerce owners um, identify hidden revenue opportunities in their um, existing sales process? Yeah. So I mean, the first place I always tell people to start is assuming you already have some some steady traffic and you've got customers coming in, then that means people are active in your sales process right now. So with e-com, what's awesome is that. Mapping out your sales process is, is very simple, like I just mentioned. So it's it's really just they land on your website, they view a product, then they add the product to cart, then they do the first step of the checkout process where they give you their email address, then they do the second step of the checkout process where they actually make the payment. And what's great about if you're using Shopify, for example, and if you're using an email service provider like Klaviyo, which is the one I really like, you can have an automated email sequence in between every single one of those steps in your sales process, which means you're just going to be capturing more sales that you're already losing right now in each of those steps. So once you get those built out, you immediately are getting more sales from the traffic you already have right now, which means you're getting a higher ROI on the advertising and the content marketing you're doing to generate that traffic. So that that's really the first phase. And that's where people a lot of businesses, they just don't realize that they have these potential sales sitting there in their existing traffic and they're just not capitalizing on it. Yeah. And this is the main question, I think, for everyone. How much lift up um, have you seen by using such patterns uh, or implementing such patterns if they were not there before? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it can be pretty big. So it can be yeah. um, in in a, in a short amount of time, in a matter of a few months to a year, 
it could be anywhere from doubling your revenue to like, you know, 5x or more your revenue. And that's that that's not really as crazy as it sounds. It's 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 just a matter of those potential sales are already there and you're just not doing these things that are that are honestly, if you don't have the resources to even hire an agency or anything, these are things that you can go on YouTube and you can get these implemented and be doing a pretty good job with them on your own. So I, I wouldn't let the learning curve, you know, scare anyone away from jumping on this, especially if you're using Clavio. They have amazing resources. They have a lot of pre-built out templates that give you a, a decent starting point. And those things alone are going to improve your revenue. So like if you don't have an abandoned checkout flow, doesn't matter how bad your abandoned checkout flow is, unless you just offend people and make them mad, you're going to get more sales than not having one. Very interesting. Yeah. And uh, I think that the numbers are amazing. I mean, I expected the lift up of, don't know, so around about 20% maybe, but doubling or even 5x, uh, something that, that's really amazing. I mean, of course, it needs to be done properly and with, with a good uh, knowledge, but don't having it at all means uh, you're extremely losing up in, in, in potential uh, revenue. Yeah, and really quickly, I just want to make sure like that I'm not coming off as trying to exaggerate. So I'm comparing it if you just don't have any of this stuff in place, right? So yeah, if, it if you have already it, have this yeah. stuff in place, you're not going to see that dramatic of a change. But again, for a lot of people listening, they might not have any of this. And so this is yeah. like, this is a big opportunity for them. To be honest, I um, although this is already some kind of a standard, um, if you're visiting web stores and and, and 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 buying products, such email sequences are not used often, uh, at least here in Europe, uh, because this comes or leads to another question that I have: uh, legal situation. Uh, um, am I allowed if there is no opt-in for getting? A, a newsletter uh, to get an abundant card email. How is that? So this is uh, first of all, I don't, I don't want to give any legal advice, but I will give you. Yeah. Um, I will share how this works or how this happens because this is uh, what you're mentioning specifically. This is an interesting one. So it's one thing if you have, say, for example, you started the checkout process on a site where you gave them their email. There may be some fine print on their site that where you didn't know it, but you actually agreed to opt in. That's you kind of expect. We all kind of expect once we put our email address into a site, we kind of know what's what could happen. Now, what's very weird is when you shop for a site that you've never given them their email address and then you get an email back, and then that is kind of alarming. You're wondering, how did they know the way? Yeah. So, how this works is whenever you, um, the, all the big brands, so you know, um, like Amazon, I don't know if Amazon specifically sells their stuff, but. Um, let's say like New York Times, all the big uh, media giants, they definitely are are very big on doing this. Um, I don't want to name specific retailers, but a lot of the big retailer brands do this. I, I just can't say like off the top of my head which ones exactly. But it's so, so common that here's the deal is that they sell their lists to these companies that basically aggregate all of that information. And by using, because they have so much information collected on you from these different sources, the company that sells a service to e-com businesses or other businesses that allows them to be able to send that abandoned cart to someone who's never opted in, what they're doing is they have technology that they have enough data points on the cookies in your browser right now. So your browsing history, um, other sites that you're logged into and your location that they can say like with, and they can change their, their um, how strict they are in this, but they can say like with an 80% um, accuracy that they're pretty sure that this is actually you and the e -com business can pay for that service to be able to send those emails where they're using this software to identify email addresses of their traffic even though those people haven't opted in and techni the technical legal workaround here is because when you opted into that original source whether it was New York Times or whoever in their fine print they actually say that they can uh, sell your information and or they could give it away or you know they can do whatever they want with it so so they they can be tracked back to where you have chosen to opt in to a company that told you that even though they didn't obviously <laughs> like tell you up front but they tell you that they could do this and in fact they did do it and that's how you're getting those emails 
That's uh, amazing. Yeah, it's it's really uh, to to hear that, to see that. I mean, we all know that our data is um, is, is sold. Yeah? I mean, that's the business. If the product is free, you are the product, and uh, and and this is happening. But uh, it's a huge benefit for the e-commerce store owners, actually. Yeah, and and by the way, whenever I talk about all these email flows, I'm really referring to uh, the ones that you create in your software for people who have opted in to like, I don't yeah. now I have some clients who use those services and I have some clients that don't, I think it comes down to some people are just, uh, some business owners are comfortable with it. Some aren't, if you want to know the behind the scenes take, the truth is it's, it tends to be profitable. It, it works. Yeah. And the, honestly, the complaints aren't as frequent as you would expect. The, of course, some people are going to freak out whenever that happens, but more often than not, people actually just buy and they don't complain, which is kind of strange, but that's... Which is, which is yeah. good, yeah. which is good. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, um, those people who complain are also complaining if they get a newsletter that they opted in two months later when they forgot that they opted in. Exactly, so. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're online, yeah. it's it's inevitable. Your email's going everywhere. Yeah, that that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, but it's not about just the sequence, right? So uh, whenever you have email marketing in place or writing SMS or what else, it's also about key elements. It's about storytelling. Yeah? Uh, what, what do you recommend um, to, to, to e-commerce store owners how to build a compelling story about that brand or about the products? Okay, so this this is to me is one of the most powerful things and all the the big brands that invest a ton of money in figuring this out. And this is something that if you are a small business owner where you can immediately stand out from your direct competition by doing this. So the problem that business owners face is that you have a lot of, um, I mean, your most direct competitors most of the time are selling products that have very similar features. And, and let's just assume that you're selling something that's high quality there's only so high of quality you can get. And assuming your your best competitors are also at that same level of high quality, there's usually only going to be a couple of little feature differences. So then it's it's like, okay, how do I stand out? But also for the customers, if you think from their perspective, how do you make an easy buying decision? And where the answer to that is by having a brand story and having marketing and branding that really caters to them and really resonates with them. So the first place I, or the best resource I always recommend to people to just get started on doing this is actually a book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And he's got a whole other program course and other stuff he does. Um, but the, they have this framework where they will take you through and their, their whole concept is that you want to define the hero of your brand story and you want the hero of your brand story to be your ideal customer. Whereas we naturally a lot of times think that the hero of our brand story should be our brand and that we should present us or our products as the hero, but it's actually the opposite. You want your ideal customer to be the hero and then you want to define the problems they're facing, define the ideal outcomes they want to experience, and then you present your brand or your product as the guide that helps them realize that ideal outcome. So just to give you a you know, quick example, let's just say you're targeting people who love hiking and outdoor adventures and you know they love the feeling of pushing themselves to hike bigger and bigger mountains um, and they they that's where they get the satisfaction is whenever they're doing that they they feel better about themselves or just having a lot of fun but one of the problems they face is that they get really dehydrated and that limits uh you know how big of a mountain they can hike or how far they can go or whatever so if but if they add your electrolyte partner powder to their water bottle, now they can push themselves harder for longer and they can achieve bigger and bigger accomplishments in the hobby that they love. So the way you, you're presenting this is you're not trying to present your electrolyte powder as the hero. It's helping them be a bigger hero, right? It's like you're just kind of giving them that little thing they needed, but ultimately you're focusing it on them and you're focusing all on them getting more of what they already wanted to get. And so that's, that's the thinking. Uh, and you just have to Again, that's why I recommend that resource because you have to kind of create, you have to, you know, take a little bit of time up front to write some things down and maybe do a little research on your customers, talk to customers ideally if you can, uh, and figure out how you can present your brand in that similar way. Wow, cool. Yeah, I mean, you feel better as a 
customer, if you hear things like you just said, um, then if just a product would be presented in, in an email. So get and reach higher targets, uh, reach your goals, be faster, stronger, better, be the hero. So I really love that. Uh, and I think we can use this not only um, in, in the world of products and brandings, it's also uh, when you're talking about SaaS companies that are presenting their tools, they, a lot of them just showing the features. And what is said, actually, the features are not the thing people are looking for. Of course, they need it to understand, but they are looking how to solve the problem or achieving their targets. And talking about that might be very uh, more comfortable than just talking about features and gives you better sales. Yeah, I mean, it's just like we've all had the experience where um, a company in their marketing, it just feels like they're talking to you exactly. They just seem to know yeah. your situation as if they were a close friend. And that immediately, for one, it just it's it's all actually kind of a relief because sometimes making a buying decision can be a little stressful, especially if it's a higher ticket item. You just want to make sure you're making the right decision. And, and also, you know, we're all busy. We don't want to spend too much time on it. And so when someone comes up with the thing that seems like the perfect fit for you, it's for one, it's just a relief. Like, oh, okay, good. I found, I found it. I didn't have to spend, you know, way more time, but it just makes you like them and trust them more because if they know you well enough to define your problem in a way that's like almost as if it's your own words and they know that the things that you want to experience as if it was almost your own words then you know they have to be pretty good at what they do or else how would they know all that, right? Because all these other brands yeah. are just talking about their features and it's like, they don't even know what I want out of this this uh, software. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we, we've been talking about successful, how to build this successful, yeah? Make it good and the right way. What are the top three mistakes that entrepreneurs make when it comes to email marketing? Okay, so in e-com, this is... Um, I'd say the first one that comes to mind is relying too much on discounts. And uh, I, mm. so a lot of the companies we work with, we do use discounts in our email marketing. Um, sure. And so every brand is going to be kind of different as far as we, that's something we talk about up front. It's like, you know, uh, how much, how often do you want to? And most of our, our clients are in the, the category of we want to use them strategically, but not, rely on them basically some people want to never use them and in some brands they use them too much and so here here's what happens is like the first time you send a big e an email with a big discount off is you get this big spike in sales and then a lot of your customers will maybe stock up on that thing and then they don't buy for a little bit after so then the company kind of panics so then they want to do the big discount again and you get to where you train your customers to never want to buy full price because they know there's always another discount coming and I don't think that that's a good idea for protecting the value of your your brand and protecting the value of your pricing. I think it's better to have little discount incentives um, that you're using for a specific purpose. So it could be like getting that first purchase is the most common thing we do. It could be even that you're kind of like you have strategically placed automations to get them to the third purchase. Because for a lot of brands, when they can get a customer to that third purchase, that's when they really become a loyal lifetime customer. Um, or it could be you use them as a, a customer win back type of thing. So someone hasn't purchased in a while. Uh, and I also don't think that there's anything wrong with participating in Black Friday, Cyber Monday or, you know, major holiday sales. But so that's that's one thing is it's not is it not um, getting addicted to <laughs> the discounts and, and doing the little bit harder work of crafting better content where people will buy without the discounts. Uh, another common mistake is not getting your email frequency right. So what I find is that Sometimes business, smaller businesses are emailing way too often and they don't have a list that's big enough yet to really justify that. And they're actually just uh, shooting themselves in the foot because they are getting more people to just start ignoring their emails before they've even gotten big enough to where they could get away with emailing more frequently and using segmentation. Where and then on the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of times brands that are have a really big list and really high revenue and they never email their list. And it's just like, okay, you, <laughs> you can yeah, be making yeah. so much more money. You know, it's like, I can't believe it's amazing. You've gotten this far and you don't even email your list, you know? I mean, the I I know a scenario when 
when people start implementing a newsletter and they put a, f uh, a form on the website to let uh, customers sign up for the newsletter and they do not send the newsletter because the list is too small yet and they need to wait until the list is full. But I think once you offer a newsletter, you really start sending it. If it's just 10, 15, 20 people sign up for a newsletter, if you don't send it and wait until you have a thousand people there, then the first ones who signed up have forgotten already that they signed mm -hmm. up. They don't know you anymore. But I see this. Yeah, I mean, um, that's 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 a pity. Yeah, you don't need a lot of people. Uh, you know, if those are if they're interested in what you're selling, and yeah. you know, I mean, you got to start somewhere. So if it's a small list, but they're engaged and they're interested, yeah, definitely email them. Um, yeah, you don't have to wait. Like you said, you don't have to wait until you have a big list. And then when you, as your list grows, you can start doing segmentation. And that's really the third problem I was going to mention is that a big mistake people make is they send every email to everyone on their list. Now, early on, yeah. you have a small list. Yeah, that just makes sense. You're not going to take the time to to craft. If you have 20 people on your list, you're not going to like make 20 unique emails. It's just this wouldn't make sense. But as your list grows, you can start creating these smaller segments and each of those segments will have thousands of people in them. And you send them emails that are where the content is more personalized to them in that segment. And that allows you to send more emails, which means you can make more revenue from email marketing, but you're not spamming people. You're not burning them out because not everyone is getting every email. Yeah. Well, what is the right frequency for a newsletter? Uh, so I think it's really just, you have to look at your open rates and click rates. And as it, if the performance starts to dip, you might, you might need to back off. So if it say it's just a up and, you know, smaller list, uh, you know, smaller business in the early days, you know, I would say a bare minimum, if you're just, if you're kind of like, you know, not putting the time you should into email marketing, bare minimum once a month. But ideally I'd like to see, you know, a weekly email or a bi-weekly email that that's like a getting starting, getting started cadence as your list grows then you get to where you can send two, three times a week. And then as you get to you know, have a really big list and let's say you have a bunch of different product lines, different collections and products to where now you've got all different kinds of segments you can create, you can get to where you're sending daily emails and still not hitting every single person on your list every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are there currently any emerging trends in e-commerce or email marketing that business owners should keep an eye on? Um, I would say, so SMS is, it's not really new, but SMS is rapidly getting way more popular amongst consumers just over the last few years. Like it's yeah. kind of shocking how, um, cause I was always very hesitant about doing SMS myself as a marketer because I used to not like it as a, as a customer or as a consumer. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like it was kind of a, just a more sensitive private, you know, channel to, to market to. But I'm in the minority, actually. Um, <laughs> nowadays, especially with younger buyers, uh, they prefer that. A lot of younger buyers, especially, right. they see their email as work. They don't like it. They don't like going to their inbox. It's They'd rather not spend any time in their email inbox if they can avoid it. And the brands that they really like and the ones that they want to shop from, they want you to have their number because they want to make sure they don't miss out on the sale or whatever the thing is. So it's been that's been very surprising that SMS is just getting so much more popular. Yeah, uh, it's also surprising for me. I mean, uh, I'm uh, I'm a bit over 40 years old and um, um, I prefer email still, yeah. Um, uh, but I can understand why, because SMS actually has changed. It more look and feels like, uh, like a chat. Huh? Uh, and before that, it was really a message. And you even had to pay for uh, replying to the message, but now it's, yeah, you've, you are in WhatsApp, you are chatting on Facebook, you're chatting on, uh, wherever your channel is that you're uh, in and SMS maybe feels like that, but it's an interesting trend. Absolutely. Um, you can reach the people directly in the pocket, um, uh, and, and even let it vibrate and, uh, and they, um, uh, see you right away. And then email is just, yeah. Uh, more more business kind of things that's interesting mm -hmm. um maybe tell me a bit more about um uh about how can people learn about 
to, to, to make email marketing the right way or to go into that topic? Where should they go? What are the first steps? Uh, to learn, so if they just want to get, I mean, there's YouTube, there's plenty of resources, you know, courses and everything. Uh, the mm -hmm. first place, so if they're doing e-com, Klaviyo is the, I don't have a incentive to recommend them, but they're just by far my favorite. And they have amazing resources on their website. We had so often in the show Klaviyo, Klaviyo and Shopify, these are yeah. the most, <laughs> the most common tools here. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so first it's just, okay. There's going to be a learning curve with no matter which software you choose. I recommend ch yep. choosing one that caters to your type of business. So for e-com, Klaviyo is one of those. And I also recommend one choosing one that has a big community of not only just uh, like content creators, but also a big support community of actual staff on their team. So, so the cool thing about that is that anything you want to do with Klaviyo, there's a YouTube video to show you how to do it step by step. In fact, I have a bunch of videos on my channel showing like how to create a segment, how to do segmentation, how to build out some initial flows. Um, so that's that's what the easiest way to start is first just build out those flows and then get into campaigns. And then for anything that you can't figure out, I would just send tell people to go to YouTube. Now, if you're looking for specific um, like a course to buy. There, a guy who I really like is a guy named Chase Diamond. He's an he's an email marketer mm -hmm. who focuses on e-commerce, and I think he has some great uh, some great courses. In fact, there's another guy I would recommend who does more of a direct response type of stuff. Let me see if I can. I have a resource here, but I can't remember his name. I wish I knew his name so I could so I could uh, give the recommendation here. Dang it! I had to I had to follow up with you. Can't remember this guy's name, but. Um, yeah, for e-com specific, I, I would definitely recommend him and, and he has a very beginner friendly course or actually a few courses on just getting started with Klaviyo. Perfect. We can, uh, later on, put it on the blog post as a link. So if you just, uh, send over the link later on, we can put it there, um, as well, of course, to your website. Um, last question for today. Um, and, and it leads directly there. Who has taught you? most about email marketing and e-commerce in your career? Okay. I've, I've been very fortunate that when I was coming up as a freelance copywriter, I was a ghostwriter for several uh, big inbound agencies and they exposed me to a lot of different, uh, all of the biggest digital marketing courses at the time with, they gave me access to a bunch of things, right? So um, that was great. But I will say that the one person who's had by far the most profound impact on me as a marketer has been Frank Kern. So I did this. Frank mm -hmm. Kern is for people who don't know is like an at, you know legend in the digital marketing world, like one of the founding fathers of <clears throat> of digital marketing stuff. So a lot of the the strategies and tactics that digital marketers use today, especially when it comes to email marketing, are concepts that he actually invented. And he's still you know he's still active to this day. They they do all they do consulting his team and um, they do like paid advertising. They always they're always switching up their done for you services. But I did this program with him where he basically it wasn't just advertising or email. It was kind of taking you behind the scenes and teaching how he does everything. So and he and it was a, a high level program, but he gave us access to all of his stuff. So we were working we were working with him directly, and we were learning this whole concept of how he does his consulting but like not just how he sells it it was less about how he sells it and more about how you actually get results for the clients that you're working with and the thing that stood out to me with him is just the way that he ex the way his mind explains how to create these different systems really resonated with me and just took my game to another level because i was already that was already the area that i really gravitated towards and i was always i was already good at email marketing but once I started to, he kind of showed like how to break away from relying on all the formulas and all the, the typical, you know, uh, flows and the, the just, you know, not have thinking beyond that and just understanding the underlying principles that you need to know and like what result you need to get and having the freedom to change things to get those results. And when I applied that to e -com, that's where I really had a lot of success. So it was, it was taking that which that information could be applied towards any business. But when I applied it towards the e-com sales process and email marketing for e-com specifically, 
that's where I just saw the most dramatic results. And so, yeah, he's, uh, I highly recommend Frank Kern. Um, he's by far been the most beneficial person for me. Awesome. Thanks so much for that really good and long, uh, explanation. Um, yeah, guys, um, if you don't have yet implemented some sequences uh, for your e-commerce store, it's time to do that. Uh, there are a lot of resources you can find also in the blog post uh, to this podcast and in some comments. And of course, you can check out elevateandscale.com by Kyle, uh, get in touch with them and see how Kyle can help you to grow your e-com business using email marketing and campaigns. Um, thanks so much, Kyle, for joining. Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah, we were very great. It was really a cool show. And uh, yeah, if you liked it, just um, um, like our podcast and come back for the next episode. Um, and we will always talk with uh, great founders and cool ideas and uh, about e-commerce operations. This is uh, a great chance to learn new opportunities and features. Talk soon. Bye-bye. And that's it for this episode of the Ecom Ops Podcast. If you enjoyed listening and would like us to find and interview more e-commerce operations experts, please search for Ecom Ops Podcast in your favorite podcast listening app and then subscribe, rate, and review. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>